Jesus has triumphantly entered Jerusalem, beginning the last week of his life. He weeps. He drives out the merchants from the temple. His authority is questioned, questioned three times. First question, by what authority are you doing these things? Jesus responds by telling the parable of the wicked tenants. Ouch, go the authorities. They ask about the paying of taxes. Jesus notes that it is Caesar's head on Caesar's coin and says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. Double ouch to the authorities. Which brings the authorities to their third and final question, enter the Sadducees. Our scripture reading is Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 38. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but with no, t no children, the man shall marry the widow and... Um, raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died in the resurrection. Therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God. Being children of the resurrection and the fact that the ch that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living for him. All of them are alive. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I bring you greetings from the uh, Indiana region of the Disciples of Christ. We had our regional convention yesterday down in Indianapolis. Tony and Mariana joined me. It was delightful. Um, some good preaching, some good teaching, and lots of good people and friends that bring uh, their greetings to the congregation here from the congregation spread all over the state of Indiana. Before I start my sermon, allow me a moment to preach. If you haven't already voted on Tuesday, or voted, vote on Tuesday. Vote for this candidate, vote for that candidate. Who knows? Maybe your vote can become part of a movement for wholeness and healing in our fractured nation. So vote that we may continue to strive for a more perfect union. Somehow, some way. And then I put on my hat. Maybe a more perfect union or world of wonder and peace and justice is simply not possible in this life. Hmm. Maybe we do need to wait for the final resurrection. And that is, is simply not possible for human beings to find a way to bring justice and peace into our ways of living with one another. Hmm. Maybe Cain will always kill Abel, as it is in Scripture. Maybe Augustine was right about original sin. Now that we've been kicked out of Eden, paradise on this earth in our time, or even our children's time, or our children's children's time is simply not possible. Sure, in some theologies, the cosmic Christ comes to save the day so that on the day of judgment, Assuming we have dotted our confessional I's and crossed our theological T's, 
All will be made well in eternity with a capital E. And our time in the long queue at the pearly gates will pass as if no time has passed at all. And St. Peter will bid us welcome. And we'll step into the misting and floating clouds around us with the heavenly host singing, Hallelujah! But, and I don't like to use the word but because I always think God is a God of and. But, because I believe that God is always a God of and, excuse me, thankfully, I can bring myself out of this despondent and pessimistic way of thinking with the following words. Words that encourage, we say it every week, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my mind, earth has a chance and the people on it. Call it hope. Call it grace like rain. But I've drifted away from the tale of the widow with seven husbands. Maybe some of you were taught how to pronounce Sadducee in Sunday school with the mnemonic saying they didn't believe in resurrection. That's because they were sad, you see. Uh, this is the only time the Sadducees make an appearance in the Gospel of Luke. And the question they ask is a bit of foreshadowing of Jesus' resurrection coming up with, at the end of this week. They ask him a question about Torah, beginning, Teacher, Moses wrote. They then share what appears to be an absurd situation that points to the absurdity of resurrection if resurrection were true. Jesus disagrees. And he points to the Torah himself and declares God is a God of the living. And in the midst of these statements is what could be described as a merry mess. But isn't that what life is? Henry David Thoreau was once asked, what do you think of the world to come? Thoreau replied, one world at a time. And this is basically what Jesus responds with as well. One world at a time. Sure, Jesus acknowledges resurrection. He says, indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God being children of the resurrection. Yet, Jesus does not say what resurrection is all about in his answer to the Sadducees. Instead, he returns the discussion to the living. Jesus pushes resurrection into the present moment by saying that God, in answering Moses at the burning bush, says in the present tense, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac. As if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive. In God, in other words, there is no such thing as death. Another way to look at what is happening here is to recognize the premise of the Sadducees' question that eternal life will be more of the same if it exists. Seven marriages on earth somehow needs to be figured out in heaven. Whose wife shall she be? How is this complicated state of marital affairs going to be worked out in the realm of kingdom come? Hmm. One author writes, but resurrection life, Jesus insists, is qualitatively different. The ordinary events and relationships by which we track our journey through this mortal life, marriage, childbirth, graduations, retirements, and so on, do not characterize our eternal lives because resurrection life is not merely an extension of this life, but something wholly other. But we stay, still may want to ask, what will resurrection be like? It has been said by some, if I have to listen to the angelic choir singing Hallelujah Chorus 24-7, then I don't want any part of heaven. I can agree. The music that I plan to play in the eternal room prepared for me by Christ will be from a play playlist, I hope, of my own 
choosing. And I get to thinking, maybe being dead is not about being dead at all. Remember the words of Miracle Max in the movie The Princess Bride? Hopefully some of you have seen it. He says, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. Even scientists today are turning their attention to eternity. John Horgan laments about death without resurrection in the magazine Scientific American in a recent edition. He writes, compounding my concern is the possibility that, no, probability, that one day humanity and all its residues will vanish. Our works of science, mathematics, philosophy, art, music, and yes, journalism will slip back into the void whence they came. Everything we have thought and done will be for naught. If nothing about us endures, if nothing is remembered, we might as well have never existed. He goes on, No wonder so many of us, even in this age of scientific materialism, still believe in God, an immortal, omniscient being watching over each and every one of us, and not just celebrities like Einstein and Beyonce. He, she, it, they also surely remembers us after we're gone, like a cosmic backup device with infinite storage capacity. I love that new name for God. I need to try it out. Let's try this. Oh, great cosmic backup device with infinite storage capacity. Please don't forget about me and prevent any viruses from attacking the data of my life so that I may live forever as ones and zeros in the great super digital supercomputer in the sky. It has a ring to it, I think. The theoretical physicist Leonard Susskind argues for the possibility of eternal life, scientifically argues for eternal life, when he looks at the mathematics and science of black holes. He contends that matter entering a black hole is preserved in the form of data. Should a black hole consume our world as it may happen, all our information, which is in a sense what matter is, will be compressed and preserved on the surface of the black hole's horizon. Oh my. Our entire lives saved on the fringes of a black hole so that maybe someday some advanced alien civilization will have the capability to parse the data of my life out of the black hole into a resurrected existence. And that's science. Oh my. I get to thinking, good thing Jesus keeps his response simple, right? But what is Jesus responding to? Remember two weeks ago when I made the following comment about parables? When I know what the parable means, then I'm missing the meaning of the parable. Today's scripture reading offers a parable, and we think the characters that are involved are the Sadducees and Jesus. We think the point of the parable is about resurrection. And on one layer of interpretation, it is. And, notice I'm starting to say and, and there is something else going on here. What might that be? Or, who are we forgetting about and thus dismissing? The widow. There was a woman, and there were seven brothers. The first married the woman and died childless. Then the second and third married her. And so, in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. This scenario, though bordering on the absurd, is a good example of following the law of Moses as it's laid out in the book of Deuteronomy. In order for the property and the name of the man to be perpetuated, the law required upon the man's death that a brother marry the widow. 
seven marriages for the sake of the name and for the sake of the property of the brothers. Seven marriages, childless. And at the end, we are told in a heartbreaking line, finally, the woman also died. Mm. Simply discarded. Finally, the woman also died. Under the scenario that the Sadducees propose and believe in, while at the same time ridiculing resurrection, that's it for the woman. Not only does no one remember the name of the first brother or brothers, no one's left to remember her. What an incredibly bleak and hopeless worldview the Sadducees offer. It cannot be. Remember at the close of the scene where Jesus is anointed by a woman in Bethany? Mm. Jesus says, truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. I can't help but think that Jesus is thinking the same thing in this situation. I imagine that in the words Jesus is speaking to the Sadducees, he's really speaking to the widowed woman and to all who are in situations of being forgotten and in places of hopelessness given the vicissitudes of life. Jesus says to them, those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, these words speak to all of us. They cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. Hmm. Imagine bringing that type of hope to someone in the midst of despair. Sure, there are days when I, like the Sadducees, I'm all caught up in death and the death-dealing ways of the world. I can go there. There are days when I despair about the death of my beloved daughter, Sydney Marie. But then I remember, and I hope. And Jesus' final words at the end of the Gospel of Matthew come to my mind. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Now. A God of the living. Now. And always. Amen. Amen.